Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills. Our minister is Reverend Bob Janice Dillon, and I am Liz Thomas, the worship associate for this morning's service. Today, we have attendees both in person, in the sanctuary, as well as virtually via Zoom. Welcome to everyone. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are guided by a set of principles and written sources that encompass the many ways we come to know and understand the world, the universe, and the divine. Our principles are important to us at UU Catskills, and we live our values on a daily basis. We affirm that black lives matter. We are a welcoming congregation for the LGBTQ community. We are a congregational affiliate of the Ulster Immigrant Defense Network, and we are an active voice in the effort to address climate change. Community circles connect members with others who live in their local community. The nine circles meet monthly in person or online through Zoom. If you would like to get in touch with a circle in your area, please contact the office administrator. If you would like to contact someone at UU Catskills for those attending online, a contact list is shown on your screen. Visit our website, uucatskills.org, to find contact information, to be added to the mailing list, and to find the latest newsletter. If you are a visitor on Zoom and would like to be added to our mailing list, you can put your name and email address in the chat box. We encourage you to read our monthly newsletter that members and others on our distribution list receive by email. It is also found on our website. In it, you will find the happenings in our UU community and also upcoming events for the month. We have several announcements this morning. First, our Food Justice Working Group will be having a Fill the Truck event next Sunday. We want to fill the truck with bags of food that will be delivered to the community blue fridge at 122 Clinton Avenue. There are many people going through food insecurity and the pantry shelves need many more food donations. Thanks to Paula Silby, Nancy Emery, and Polly Pfeiffer for helping to organize this event. You will be given a bag as you leave today. Return the bag filled with non-perishable food items next Sunday, and let's fill the truck with bags of food that will be delivered to the community fridge. See Karen Miller for more information. We have a new fundraiser for the congregation, and it's a fun one. On Sunday, June 19th, we will be raffling off themed baskets to benefit UUCC. The baskets may include a banned books basket, which will include books from school councils uh, that, wait, sorry, which will include the books some school councils are trying to ban, a beauty basket, a four kids only basket, and an eat, pray, love basket. Raffle tickets are available for $1 each or 15 tickets for $10. If you'd like to get tickets, please see Aaron Burton or Carol Ryder seated right here. <laughs> a rem uh, coming up for this week, a reminder that a half hour after today's service, there will be a budget hearing uh, and that the annual budget meeting is scheduled for June 5th after that Sunday service. Please note that child care will be provided for both. The grief support group is meeting on Sunday evening at 7. Monday night Bible group is at 7 p.m. The writing group meets at 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Contact Alyssa to join. This Wednesday, June 1st, the 30 plus group will be meeting at 6 p.m. for an after school and after work picnic at Bard College. Please contact Erin for details or to RSVP. And Reverend Bob's first Thursday hangout for the month of June will be Thursday, June 2nd at 11 a.m. via Zoom. Thanks to everyone who is assisting with today's service. Our hybrid services are made possible by our technical team. The tech host in the sanctuary is Bruce Wildey who provides for our live streaming from the pulpit. Our Zoom host and monitor this week is Jenny Giddy. For our prelude this morning, Catherine Catabiani will perform Portrait of Burt Williams. 
by Duke Ellington. Good morning. Good morning. As Liz said, we welcome you, uh, whether you're joining in the sanctuary this morning or on, on Zoom, it is wonderful to be together. It is a gathering of peace. If you breathe in, you can breathe in the peace, the beauty, the wonder of being together to share this hour. It's a uh, peace that may be filled with uh, anxiety and worry and stress and and, uh, and all sorts of emotions, but it's also so wonderful to be together and a sense of joy and peace and delight. Speaking of delight, I'm wondering if I can call on Maddie and her family to light our chalice this morning. Would that be all right to help us light our chalice? Our chalice, uh, 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 words uh, this morning is by the uh, Polish uh, noble uh, Peace uh, Nobel Literature Prize, Wyszlawa Szymborska, and I apologize if I get her name wrong, Wyszlawa Szymborska from her poem, Life While You Wait. Life While You Wait. Performance without rehearsal. I know nothing of the role I play. I only know it's mine. I can't exchange it. I have to guess on the spot just what this play is all about. If only I could re just rehearse one Wednesday in advance or repeat a single Thursday that has passed. But here comes Friday with a script I haven't seen. I'm standing on the set and I see how strong it is. The props are surprisingly precise. The machine rotating the stage has been around even longer. The farthest galaxies have been turned on. Oh no, there's no question, this must be the premiere. And whatever I do will become forever what I have done. Now let us read together these words we read every week, our unison affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again that we are not isolated, but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and in each other. And I'd like to invite our worship associate, Liz uh, Thomas, to read our opening words, which are from The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hess, another noble. If only there were a dogma to believe in. Everything is contradictory. Everything is tangential. There are no certainties anywhere. Everything can be interpreted one way and then again interpreted in the opposite sense. The whole of world history can be explained as development and progress and can also be seen as nothing but decadence and meaninglessness. Isn't there any truth? Is there no real and valid doctrine? 
Joseph Necht said this to his music master. There is truth, my boy, but the doctrine you desire, absolute perfect dogma that alone provides wisdom, does not exist. Nor should you long for a perfect doctrine, my friend. Rather, you should long for perfection in yourself. The deity is within you, not in ideas and books. Truth is lived, not taught. Let us sing together our opening hymn. It's in the gray hymnals, hymn number 22, Dear Weaver of Our Life's Design. weavers in the congregation. There's a weaving show at the moment, isn't there, Judith? Check it out if you have any more stuff. So now we have a very special, joyous celebration this uh, Sunday, and I'd like to invite forward uh, the Garay family, Lisa, John, and Madeline. On behalf of the Garay family, Lisa, John, and Madeline Grace, I greet you on this very special day. We are gathered here to honor a child, that's you, a child that has been in this world for a few years now. It is important that this dedication uh, is happening here. It's a, it's a wonderful thing as we, honor, as we welcome Maddie to her congregation as well. And we are here to celebrate her unique identity and growing life. As it says in the Psalms, how good and pleasant it is when family live together in peace and how good it is for so many people to come together today to, uh, to celebrate this amazing human being and her family and friends. And speaking of family, I know we have several people who are joining us online and I wrote their names down. Help me out. Who's joining us online? Marcy Gray. Nana. Nana. Nana's joining us. Who else is joining us online? Gigi. Gigi. Norma Henderson. Yeah, yeah, Found it. Know. There we go. It's all about him. <laughs> Nana's joining us. Marcy Garay. Gigi. Norma Henderson. Great uh, grandmother. And Papu and Yaya. Did I get that right? Christos and Gina Cironis, who are grandfather and step grandmother, and Uncle Chris and cousin Dylan. So for all the family, we are so delighted that you're with us, that we can be together uh, virtually, and that you're here at this occasion. Uh, we, we honor you, and we're so glad that you're, you're here with, with, uh, together as, as one family, and we are delighted to be with you. This ceremony that we're taking part in today is both as new as today, this is this ceremony today, and it's also as timeless as human history. With each generation, people have been brought to awesome wonder by witnessing to their children's own spirit. 
and the development of that spirit. We've been brought to wonder by watching our children grow. People have gathered together in many different ways over the centuries to honor the child who is growing amongst us. And so we're participating in a, a deep and wide tradition here today, and we also make it our own. For each one of us, it can be said there will be no one like you, exactly like you, in a million, million years. Which is just awesome, isn't it? It's an awesome, beautiful thing, and it's a challenge as well to be the most you that you can be. Because no one else is going to be you, not ever. And you are yourself, but you also carry your ancestors with you, and you're a part of your family at the same time. So each person lives into the unique possibilities and challenges of their own life. And as the community of the spirit, we are here to help them become not who we want you to be, but who you are called to be from the inside. So let me say something to our parents. Lisa and John, to you as parents, let me say this. In presenting your child at this service, you invite all of us to share some of the joy and responsibility that is yours as parents. You seek our support in your dedication to the task of fostering, with love and guidance, the fullest unfolding of the personality of this child. Your task may not be, always be an easy one. I suspect you know that after several years of parenting. <laughs> the time may come when you will be called upon to sacrifice ambitions, at times deny yourself pleasure, or set aside your own dreams for a time so that your child may tread more surely the onward path of life. But you accept this service to another life, knowing that your own lives will be fuller and richer in consequence. So I ask you now, Lisa and John, do you promise that to your best of your human abilities, you will help this child to an appreciation of truth and beauty, uprightness of character and love? If so, please say, we do. We do. Many blessings. Now, can I invite forward Emma, Ali, and Willet? So, Emma, Ali, and Willet are beloved friends of this family. You're Team Maddie, right? And Emma, to you as godmother, let me say this. There's an old proverb from the uh, Jewish tradition, as it happens. Proverb that says, in time of travail, go to the friend of your father, go to the friend of your mother. From ancient wisdom, in many different traditions, come the idea of godparents, or special people, who dedicate themselves to watching out for the welfare of others' children. It is a noble and loving tradition that you participate in there, in, to commit yourselves this day. As another wonderful saying says, it takes a village. And in our complex world, it is not possible for even the most loving and capable of parents to raise a child alone. If our children are to become loving and independent adults, they need the wisdom, counsel, love, and support of friends. You have been asked by, this parent, by, by the parents of this child to accept a special honor and responsibility. Ali and Willett, as Emma's children, who Maddie looks up to and adores, I think you know that, right? You can help teach Maddie about when someone has your back, when you can turn to someone no matter what has gone wrong in life. A bit older, a bit wiser, she can learn from you the values of responsibility, loyalty, faith, making the most of life, and caring from each other. So Emma and, and Willett and Ollie, so I ask you, do you now, to the best of your abilities, intend to supplement the care and love of these wonderful parents both for the day-to-day -day development of this wonderful child and especially in the event of any extraordinary need. If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. Blessed be. May this commitment and dedication enrich and ennoble your lives. So now we're gonna invite all our children forward because we have the children. I think we just have Jake today. We have some who are watching from Zoom who um, can't be here today. And so they're, oh, Eleanor, Eleanor. It's Jake and Eleanor. So we have, um, we wanted to talk about why this is special, and sometimes I think the best way to say why something is special is by means of a story. So I have a favorite story of mine um, that Jane is gonna read. Jane Podell is a director of religious education, you know that, I'm saying it for the other. Um, so uh, Jane is gonna read about how each one of you is a wonderful thing and a wonderful blessing on this world. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm kind of close. 
On the eve of your birth, word of your coming passed from animal to animal. The reindeer told the Arctic terns, who told the humpback whales, who told the Pacific salmon, who told the monarch butterflies, who told the green turtles, who told the European eel, who told the busy garden warblers, and the marvelous news migrated worldwide. On the day you were born, the round planet Earth turned toward your morning sky, whirling past darkness, spinning the night into light. On the day you were born, gravity's strong pull held you to the Earth with a promise that you would never float away. While deep in space, the burning sun sent up towering flames, lighting your sky from dawn until dusk. On the day you were born, a forest of tall trees collected the sun's light in their leaves, where in silent mystery, they made oxygen for you to breathe. While close to your skin and as high as the sky air rushed in and blew about, invisibly protecting you and all living things on Earth. On the day you were born, the Earth turned, the moon pulled, the sun flared, and then, with a push, you slipped out of the dark quiet, where suddenly you could hear a circle of people singing with voices familiar and clear. Welcome to the spinning world, the people sang as they washed your new tiny hands. Welcome to the green earth, the people sang as they wrapped your wet, slippery body. And as they held you close, they whispered into your open, curving ear, we are so glad you've come. The end. So part of this dedication is saying how glad we are for each and every one of you. Each and every one of you, we're so glad that you've come and you were eagerly, oh, ex, ex, we've been excited about you and we've been excited about you every day, actually, as you, as you grow, as you, as you are who you are. But it's not just about the grown-ups here because you have a job to do as well. And do you know what that job is? So you said it's being a good friend to, um, to Maddie, but to, to, to children everywhere, right? And so you can help because everybody, you know, parents and adults, we like to think we're really important, but really important to kids is other kids, right? You you're play a really important role. So I want to ask you if that's okay to all the children here, will you promise to love Maddie, to play with her, to grow up with, with Maddie and other children and be a friend and to teach her all the wonders of life? If so, please say, we do. May you too find those who are kind and fair and good to you. Um, we're all in this together. Speaking of which, I want to invite the whole congregation to rise in body or spirit if you wish, because you have a role to play as well. Before you now is a child, every bit as important as any human being who has ever lived, a crucial and beautiful individual part of the life of the universe. This child will grow up in this world and inherit the fruits of the seeds we have planted. Recognizing the beauty and potential and inherent worth of this child. So I ask you now, do you endeavor to help provide a congregation that will be there to help this child grow and learn? And do you also endeavor to work toward a better world for this child and all children? If so, please say, we do. We do. May it be so. Please be seated. Okay, Maddie, here we come. We've been talking about your, your life, but you are your own person. You get to make your own decisions in this, this, this life. But you're also a part of a family, right? You've got your, your mom and your dad, but you've also got all kinds of other people. Remember your ancestors, especially your grandmother in heaven, Matsi Henderson Cironis, your grandfather, Emmanuel Garay, and your great-grand-aunt, Jerry Poine. You are not alone, Maddie. You also have the great spiritual teachers to teach you, Jesus and Buddha, among others who are still with us in the way in which they call us to live better lives, to seek wisdom and love one another. So you have many teachers, including Jesus and Buddha. But really, it's down to you, so I'm gonna ask you, Maddie, are you ready? Maddie, do you promise to practice the golden rule and strive to be kind and the best helper you can be 
Will you give thanks for all that you have and honor and care for Mother Nature? Will you work hard to be a peaceful, laughing warrior in life? If so, please say, I do. I do. Amen. May it be so. We now move forward to a singular part of the child dedication of this fellowship, a ritual of blessing. Uh, she is a part of the family of creation, the family of this congregation, and of course her own family. Knowing this, we bless you in, in behalf of the entire congregation with the most ancient and revered elements known to humankind. John and Lisa, by what name is this child known? Madeline Grace Gray. Gray. Madeline Grace Gray, or as we you lovingly call her, Maddie. So, if uh, Jane, if you come forward with me. So we have four elements here today. This is with Earth. Are you ready to do it? Do you want a little, maybe on your arm? Are you okay with a little? We'll do the rose after. So, Maddie, with Earth, which is as solid and sacred as you are, we bless you. Take care of yourself, for you too, like the earth, are a rare and precious gift to be treated well with reverence and respect. And now with air, which is as fluctuating as your feelings and passions, we bless you. Do not hide your feelings, and likewise do not let your passions overwhelm you. May you know balance and serenity in the depths of your heart. with fire from our flaming chalice, which is as illuminating as your mind, we bless you. May you use your thoughts and dreams to bring more justice, love, and care into our world. Now water symbolizes the purity of life newly created and the mystery of life ever unfolding. We touch your head, your hand, and your heart. Wishing for you reasoned thinking, compassionate action, and a peaceful, loving heart. And we give you this rose as a reminder that you are unique and beautiful and you are just the way you are and others help you grow as well. That's another reminder that there are others who will help you grow but they are helping you to become the most you, the most Maddie, the most Madeline Grace Gray that you can possibly be. For the gift of childhood and for this child in particular, we rejoice and give great thanks. May Maddie receive abundantly of life's blessings and in turn give back abundantly to her common heritage of goodness, justice, and mercy, a legacy that endures from generation to generation. This morning we have ritually named Madeline Grace Garay, dedicated ourselves to her care, and blessed her with the common and infinitely precious elements of all life. May we remember that on this day we have also dedicated ourselves to making the world a good and safe place for all children. Ours, as well as those we will never meet or know. May this ritual of welcome work its small miracle in our hearts, molding our lives more and more in accordance with that beauty, truth, goodness, and love we wish for in the life of this beautiful, strong, delicate, wonderful child. And for children everywhere. May it indeed be so. To close this portion, and for one more blessing, we have a reading uh, by Liz Thomas. Thank you, Liz. A reading by Khalil Gibran. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, speak to us of children. And he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you 
but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and the daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You can give them your love, but not your thoughts. For they have their own thoughts. They have their own thoughts. You can house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in a place of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You can strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. Strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. Now, thank you so much, Liz. Now we'll sing our children to their uh, uh, um, uh, time, uh, time with uh, their director of religious education. Thank you, Jane. And next week, just we'll have a procession of the animals. We've got a very special time for all ages next week as well. So um, thank you, and we love you, Maddie. We love you all, our children. Let us sing our children. a time now of uh, joys and sorrows, which is a time for the community to say what is on our hearts. We will be um, talking about the, the, what, uh, the, the, the tragedy this week in, in, our, in, the, in the prayer, um, but you're welcome to mention. Um, so if anyone, as is our tradition, if you have a joy or a sorrow to share with this community, if you could either raise your hand or um, if you put it in the chat on Zoom, we will read it aloud. Hi, I'm Jenny O'Grady Giddy, and I'm so delighted that I was able to bring my granddaughter, Eleanor, to the service today. And um, I found the reading of On Children so uh, moving as I read that at um, my son's wedding many years ago. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Sandy Pearson, and I've been kind of absent from the congregation for the last uh, year or two, not only because of COVID, but because I've been caring for my sister who has advanced dementia. Um, in the meantime, I also had an accident uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I decided it might be God saying you shouldn't drive anymore. So um, I'm not sure whether that's the case, but I am experimenting with trying to get around by the bus, and I am finding that I can do that for most things, but the thing I cannot do is get here by bus. So I may be calling upon people from time to time to give me a ride. And if you, if you can't do it, that's just fine. Just say no, and I'll go on to somebody else, but I really want to stay connected to this congregation. Thank you, Sandy. We offer our love and support and rides, hopefully, and to you and to your sister as well. I just wanted to announce that on Tuesday, it's Mary Alice Scully's 80th birthday. Okay. <laughs> 
birthday. Very happy birthday. Many happy returns, Mary Alice. Uh, Mark uh, Hounstein writes uh, that today he remembers his birth, his, his, today he remembers his brother who died uh, uh, tragi tr tragically seven years ago today, or 37 years ago today. Um, so for Randy, we, uh, we honor his memory with love and sorrow. And uh, Barbara and Andrew write that a dear friend of theirs is terminally ill, uh, is uh, happy, and accepting, and so it is both a sorrow and a joy, and we're holding your friend in our hearts as well. We'll put one more stone in for the many, um, was there any, sorry, for, for the many sorrows and joys uh, and hopes and concerns that are on our hearts in this turbulent times, and know that whether spoken or unspoken, you are not alone. Uh, we're all aware of the awful tragedy in Uvalde, and, um, and it's also Memorial Day. It's a time when uh, we memorialize often soldiers who are far too young anyway, but this is way, way too young. Um, and um, um, our hearts fill with uh, anger and sorrow and rage. And sometimes it's hard to know what to say. But what we will do is remember. So uh, Laura Camper Thompson um, very helpfully put together a list of those who have died in the horrendous attacks in Ovalde. And um, we're going to read those names to honor them. And there's also a little bit about who they are. So we remember them as, as whole people, these wonderful children and teachers. Navia Bravo, 10. Her name is Heaven spelled backwards. She loved to make people smile. Ava Morales, age 44, an educator for 17 years. She taught fourth graders at Robb Elementary School. 10-year-old Xavier Lopez loved cracking jokes or dancing cumbia. Jose Flores, 10, was a fourth grader who loved to play baseball. Irma Garcia, 48 was a fourth grade teacher at Robb Elementary, loved to cook and fish and teach youngsters how to read. On Thursday, her husband, Jose Garcia, died of a heart attack shortly after her memoir. Ellie Garcia, aged nine, loved singing and dancing. Tess Mata, 10, loved spending time with family. Lexi Rubio, 10, was a standout student and athlete who played basketball and softball. Jayla Silguero, 10, loved pink and playing games. Jacqueline Cazares, 9, recently celebrated her first communion. Jace Luevenos, 10, made a pot of coffee for his grandparents, whom he lived with every morning. Miranda Mathis, 11, was smart, funny, and spunky. Amory Jo Garza, 10, was an honor roll student a proud big sister and an all-around good kid. McKenna Lee Alrod, 10, loved to dance and sing. Layla Salazar, 10, won six races at the school's recent field day event. Maddie Rodriguez, 10, dreamed of becoming a marine biologist. Annabelle Rodriguez, 10, was outgoing and loved to be the center of attention. Eliana Cruz Torres, 10, loved playing softball and was hoping to make the all-star team. Rogelio Torres, 10, was a smart and loving child. Alethea Ramirez, 10, loved art and playing soccer. Uziah, Uziah Garcia, 10, was getting ready for long days of football, swimming, video games, and whatever other fun the summer might offer after he finished fourth grade. We keep these honored loved ones in our hearts. And we grieve. We'll now have a time of spoken prayer followed by silent meditation, reflection, and prayer. Spirit of life and love. 
This Memorial Day weekend, we grieve all those who have died in war, all those whose lives have ended at the barrel of a gun. This Memorial Day weekend, we are bitter and upset and hurt and angry. We mourn bitterly the loss of children and teachers at one of our nation's primary schools in Uvalde. This senseless killing rocks us to our core. We are shaken up, O oh, unity beyond ourselves, O oh, hope of peace, we are shaken up. How long must we manufacture lethal weapons to put without any safeguards in the hands of angry men? How long must parents and teachers live in fear? When will peace come? We think of all the wars that have roiled this country, the Civil War, World War I and II, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and all the young men and women who have died. Many, barely more than children, given a weapon and sent off to war. They went out into a terribly difficult situation for a cause. They went out for our country, and they never came back. And families have been grieving since. Mystery of God. O oh, love that spans the generations, this cannot be what you want for us. To live in fear for our children, to live in hatred for one another. Teach us another way. Help us to learn the paths of peace. Help us to celebrate and rejoice one another as beautiful and worthy and good. Just as we did with our beloved Maddie Gurray. As a world, as a nation, and here, in the gentle space between each breath, in our gentle home between the stars, here, with each day we are given, help us to learn the path of mutual respect, of worthiness, and of peace. Peace be with us. We'll sing together uh, hymn number 159, This Is My Song.
We now uh, take our offering, which goes to the life and ministries of this congregation and is also shared in the wider community. Uh, for May 2022, half plate donations will go to Rise Up Kingston, a grassroots organization led by those experiencing racism, classism, and gender oppression on a daily basis, who organize to win with our collective power a Kingston economy that meets all of our societal environmental needs. So you can uh, donate. Uh, in, um, via the, uh, the, the, the basket, or you can donate online at uucatskills.org, or you can send uh, a check to UUCC, or there is a um, way to donate via the QR code. Thank you for all your donations. Thank you for helping this community of peace. And our offertory today is Serenade to Sweden by Duke Ellington. <laughs> So I should be used to this by now. I've been a minister for 15 years and nine of those years in the US. And every preacher does a kind of calculation on a mass shooting week, trying to decide how near was it, how many people, did it involve children? Do we need to change the whole sermon? Do we mention it in the prayer? I should be used to it by now, but of course I'm not. And I don't mean to single out preachers, think of teachers who are, whether they face these unimaginable horrors or not, are looking around their room, wondering about entrances and exits. Think about late night custodians and security guards who feel less safe during their daily rounds. Think about parents wondering what to say, hugging their children, thinking of children who are far off and grown up they're still nonetheless very near in their hearts. I think about children facing this. We should be used to this, but of course we're not, because you're not used to it and you shouldn't be used to it. This should not happen, should not happen. And I know in a congregation we face the vicissitudes of life. I know that we face our own mortality. I know that we face the fact that sometimes even people go before their time, but this should not happen with such stunning, horrible, and all too reliable regularity. It just should not. Other countries who have our resources do not face this. Japan has a 20th the number of gun shootings, gun, gun deaths. 
Canada has a 10th, the UK has a 20th. And yet, it happens here. Time and time again, we're faced with it. It seems like we can't go a week without elderly shoppers in Buffalo being gunned down or children in a schoolroom in Texas. And I don't know what to say. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir. I, we know that we need to change the way that we are as a nation if we're to have any peace in our hearts or any security at all. But I just pray that we do not become accustomed to it. As horrible as that rage and despair and the hopelessness is, it's better than getting used to it. And we have to be able to be open to that and allow it to stir us to keep trying, even though it may feel like we're hitting our head against a wall, to keep trying to make this country a little safer. It's within our means as a society to do so. And I know none of us can do it alone, and I know we face long odds in the legislature. But this is not the way that things should be. This is not the way that society should be. And until we change it, this is where we are and this is what we'll get. We've apparently enshrined in our constitution the right of anyone to commit a massacre and, we can, and they can get it as easily as on the, on, in the, on the internet or at the corner store. And until we change it, that's how we're gonna be. The question is how are we going to live? And we need to discover how to live as human beings in the 21st century. It's not an easy century to be alive in for all our amazing contrivances, for all the things that we have to make life beautiful and good. And there are quite a few things in our lives that serve that function. But we have also have guns and nuclear weapons at our disposal, climate change, filling the air with toxins and the seas with plastic. And we know our current way of life is totally unsustainable. So how are we to live is not just a philosophical question, though it is that but it's also a practical matter of the utmost importance. How will we learn to live on this earth? As the poet said in the chalice lighting, I know nothing of the role I play. I only know it's mine. I can't exchange it. I have to guess on the spot just what this play is all about. In other words, we are making it up as we go along. Like Maddie, the child we celebrated in this service, we were all born into this world. We all have people around us Parents and family and friends who are examples of how to live. Perhaps how not to in some cases and perhaps we're a mix of both. And day by day we have to figure out what we're doing. It's like a play, the poets write, the lights have been turned on in the distant sky, the stage is in motion, spinning around, but bafflingly, bafflingly there is no script. We have to make it up as we go along. Your move. It's always your move, your next move in this game. And we have to figure it out as we go along. It's part of the reason I have a lot of sympathy for uh, biblical literalists who turn to the Bible or some other book, maybe, for an instruction manual on how to live. It's hard to wake up day after day and say, what's my line? What am I doing here? And it makes sense that you might seek a step-by-step -step guide to life. I do not think the Bible works particularly well as a step-by-step -step guide to life, although it is full of great wisdom. It's also full of inconsistencies, irreducible mystery, human foibles, and even human hatred. It does express, in places, the hope that people shall melt down their weapons and to plowshares and study war no more. And for those sorts of echoes alone, I would keep the book near at hand and do. But it's not a perfect book. No book is. So as I think about this idea that we all have a next move, I often think that I've drawn wisdom from games. I am a games player have been my whole life. Wiffle ball in the backyard, bridge and poker. I had an Atari video system. Well, my brother had an Atari video system, and when he wasn't looking, I would play it. And Dungeons and Dragons, Hopscotch, Tic-Tac-Toe, MASH, Monopoly, you name it, I've played it. And I know I'm not alone. The video game industry is now larger economically than Hollywood and the music industry combined. And the kids are all playing games, right? Now, games can teach us quite a bit about life. Depending on the game, they can teach us about determination, teamwork, to not get too upset when we lose, to not get too boastful when we win. 
We learn about how sometimes you need to make a few sacrifices to win in the end. They teach us how to be, to be careful about judging your opponent on the first move. They teach us all sorts of things. I'm also aware games don't always teach us positive lessons. They can be destructive to our mental well-being as well. Apparently, this newest school shooter was a gamer and enthusiast of Call of Duty, a first-person shooter video game. Now, I'm not saying video games cause his atrocious behavior, and I'm not for banning video games. Millions of very peaceful young people play uh, games to let off some steam. If you're a little older, you may have played Cops and Robbers or Cowboys and Indians, and apart from the stereotyping and cultural harm of the latter game, your mental health probably didn't suffer unduly for it. But I also don't take the view that games have no effect and they're just letting off steam. I've played a video game series called Grand Theft Auto. It's a game when you're encouraged to be a criminal, steal cars and worse. And as, ga as gameplay goes, it's a brilliant game. It's incredibly realistic and, and it's a and it's, uh, fantastically designed game. And I had to stop playing it and stop my children from playing it as well because it just felt too uh, encouraging of bad behavior because it was so real. And I think, and studies have tentatively borne this out, though the science is new on this, I think too much violence on the screen can bleed out into the real world. We human beings, we live in our heads. This is why books and games and stories are so important. This is where we live, as well as this. It's where this meets this. The models we keep in here walk with us out into the world. And if you say, well, I don't think of a life as a game, well, just bear in mind, we call it an SAT score, right? A higher score means you can go further, a better letter grade, it's closer to the A's or better than the F's, I'm told. Um, a better letter grade, there's more money in the paycheck. More money in the paycheck means you're winning at life, right? So there's this background chatter that says life is kind of like a game, and sometimes it says it's like a zero-sum game. Now, I love the game of Monopoly as a game. As a metaphor for life, it's horrendous. As someone, I believe here, maybe it was a different congregation, pointed out, the inventor of the prototype of Monopoly, Elizabeth McGee, created two versions of her game, The Landlord's Game. In one version, a player could amass Monopoly and in so doing, destroy his or her opponents one by one. But in the anti-monopolist version of The Landlord's Game, you have to cooperate to help every player in the game double her or his original stake in the game. That'd be a fun version, right? Guess which version was developed by Parker Brothers? <laughs> It's not the cooperative game. But I do want to give you hope. And one may seem minor, but I think it's a rather important part of hope, is that cooperative games are actually flourishing right now, especially with the younger generations, both in the board game world and the video game world. Nobody wins in Minecraft or Animal Crossing or Second Life. Games run the whole spectrum from pure competition, and I love a bit of competition now and then, to everyone seeking the same goal, or just not having a goal, everyone just wandering around and doing your thing with no ultimate winners or losers. The children have sort of left the Minecraft phase, but you may have the children who play Minecraft. I don't know if you're familiar with this game, but you just kind of dig things. It's a little like Lego. Are you familiar with Lego? It's like a, it's like a new generation of Lego, but on the screen, and you, you build stuff, and you can build whatever you want. It's very existential basically. You can, you can just create things. And I watched my, my daughter and my son, they, they, they play it often together, or even when they're apart, they build the whole city. And they built the city up with an arena and a hospital, uh, a movie theater, and it's this incredible town with all the fixings. They thought of everything. I made, by the way, a, a tunnel, a hole. I dug here, and it went over here, and then it came up here. And they kept that as a monument to their father throughout the years, even though they, it's this tiny, I can't even find it now with all the, the, the lights and the homes, and, the, and I, it doesn't really serve a purpose. It's, I just, it was all I could build. But I think about this, and it, it does sort of give me hope, because my children are trying to make this, just this, they just try and improve. Every time they go to the Minecraft world, they just try and build something that makes things a little better. And there's no winning at it, but they're trying to improve on the beauty of this world. And I think about what I can teach my children other than don't kill each other. And other than just saying I'm sorry that we still have uh, these terrible machines for the maximum killing of people available for anyone to buy at the local store. 
And I think I want to tell them that in this Minecraft world, they're on the right track. I meant to give a whole outline of, of philosophy here this week, and I'm not going to, but there's, uh, I won't give you the Kantian de deontologists and utilitarians. You've heard enough of, from me about that. But there is one idea of the modern philosophers which harkens back to the Greeks, and it's this concept of moral beauty. And I may have mentioned it before, but it just keeps speaking to me, so forgive me if I speak it again. Moral beauty is this idea that morality has a kind of aesthetic to it, that we want to make the world more beautiful. Now, moral beauty is different than physical beauty, of course, but it's the same kind of idea that it's something that we would like to encounter, to look at, to hear, to live amongst. This, this, this idea that we want the world to be a morally beautiful place, a place of kindness, a place of goodness, a place of reciprocity, a place of fairness and equity. And every time we perform an act of kindness, when we do a little something for somebody without expectation of reward, the world becomes a little more beautiful. So we are winning at that game, you might say. And when we are selfish, when we harm someone else, as we all probably do from time to time, we make the world a little bit uglier. So it's a kind of way of looking at the world. It's a mental picture, a paradigm. You might even call it a game. Let's go out there and try to make the world more beautiful is the mission of this game. And when I say it's a game, I'm not implying at all that it doesn't matter. The moral ugliness of our society is costing lives, is causing misery, is causing mass poverty and squalor in a land with great resources, is causing our children to live in fear. And surely this is not how we are meant to live. We encounter it and we shrink back. This is not how our society is meant to be. This is also in the... Uh, especially the Jewish tradition, but in the Jewish and Christian tradition. And the Bible speaks about taking care of widows and orphans, about welcoming the stranger, about laying down our weapons. It's not just a matter of doing the right thing, though it is that about right and wrong, but it's also about the kind of society we want to have. What kind of society we want to live in? How do we want to feel about our own society? See, in that society, if somebody came to your house and you didn't take care of them, it was seen as a terrible, shameful thing. It, it reflected on the whole family. They weren't willing to welcome a stranger. So it was saying, as our, as our society, shouldn't we be welcoming the stranger? Shouldn't we be kind to people who have lost their spouse or lost their parents or lost their children? And so it's, in a way, telling us or even shaming us to say we should uh, have a more beautiful society than what we have. To not take care of those in poverty is indecent. To have children cowering under desks reflects on the whole society. It's wrong, of course it's wrong, and it shows an ugliness to society. Memorial Day was born out of the horrors of the Civil War. From that ugliness, from that carnage, people almost didn't dare dream of a better world. But we knew there was a hope in that battle. And we knew we owed something to the soldiers who lay buried in the mud. We owed them something worthwhile. We owed them a more beautiful society, a free society, a beautiful society. And so many people over the last 150 years have tried to build that society brick by brick. And many times they've been frustrated. Many times they faced long odds. Many times it seemingly came to naught. But they still tried to build that society. And we have the opportunity to be builders of the good society. This shouldn't keep happening. And I know it's frustrating to keep trying to do the right thing, the beautiful thing, and then to face the larger situation that's beyond our control, which so many people have faced just what we're facing, right? But we still, it still is incumbent upon us to be builders of the good. It's not about winning the game. It's about this shared mission to create beauty. And though we may have different opinions about about moral beauty in the, in the details, we know what beauty looks like on a moral level. We know what kindness looks like. We know what fairness and equality and equity is. We can talk about it and get to know it better in our, in our family, in our brethren, in one another. But we know it and we can get to know it. So let's keep on keeping to that game. Even if someone else is playing a different game, a game of 
as Baldwin puts it, grab the gold, oppress the weak. Let's keep playing the game of creating beauty because whether we win it or we lose it, it's the game that we want to be playing, right? This is what we want to be doing. And we'll do it stridently. We'll do it uh, with, with, our, with our words and our actions and all, that, with all our heart and all our mind. And we'll do it with respect and kindness and we'll try and create a better world because too many people have tried for too long for us to give up now. May it be so. Amen. Let's uh, sing one of my favorite hymns. Now, hymn number 131, um, to give us some, some uh, guidance on the road. Love will guide us, 131. Let us say to the children, we are so glad you've come. Let us welcome one another with open arms into this lovely world. Let us love one another and let us say to one another that we will build a world worthy of our kindness and our beauty and our mercy. We can build this world, maybe only a little glimpse here and a little piece there, but we can do it every day with every act of our lives. So let us love one another as best we can and let us honor those who have died, keeping them forever in our hearts and let us live with this memory, but also in hope, let us live in peace. Amen. Amen. We now extinguish the chalice with these words we say each week. We extinguish this veil, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you Thank you to everyone who made this service possible, um, and uh, have a wonderful Sunday. Go in peace. Blessed be.